previously what people do is they poke they poke a fiber into your muscle and inspect it but now us simply applying the food dye on the surface of the skin we render the superficial skin transparent and directly visualize the muscles this is the discovery files podcast from the u.s national science foundation i'm nate potker imaging is central to biology and medicine Think about x-rays or CAT scans, techniques used to see inside the body and how vital they are to treatment. Light refracts and scatters as it hits tissues and things like lipids, complicating the imaging process and making direct observation limited. We're joined by Zahao Oh, Associate Professor of Physics at the University of Texas at Dallas, who recently published a paper demonstrating a new technique to achieve optical transparency in live tissue, a project he worked on in Guosong Hong's research group as a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. Professor Oh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it's my gr- great pleasure to share my research with you. So starting with a little bit of your trajectory to getting to this work, how did you become interested in material science? When I was uh, changing to my PhD study, I saw this very powerful tool that is emerging called liquid phase transmission electron microscopy, where you can visualize individual nanoparticles how they move together in solution and form into a large scale structure. That's what intrigued me to pursue a career in materials. I'm kind of, I'm still in material physics, but <laughs> to understand how these nanoparticles are moving together in solution and form large scale hierarchical structures. There's one concept that's in the paper a lot that I think we need to explain a little bit, and that's the Kramers-Kronig relations. Can you explain that as simply as possible? The (laughs) Kramers-Kronig relations is actually a very fundamental relation in physics. Um, A lot of times uh, when a physics property that has both what we call real part and imaginary part, these two are connected. It's not independent. So in terms of optics, the real part are the phase of the light that determines the phase and speed of the light, and the imaginary top part determines the decay, or what we call absorption. So these two properties are interconnected with each other, which means if you change absorption, it will change the phase, which is also refractive index. If you change refractive index, it will also change the, the absorption of the material. So Kramer's chronic relation basically link is a mathematical description of how you can calculate absorption from refractive index or calculate refractive index from absorption. So getting into this refraction and the start of the project, where did the idea originate? Yeah, so it's uh, actually a very interesting story behind it. So as I mentioned before, I have a training background in physics and I got my PhD in kind of material science and material physics. So I started my project by asking a very fundamental question. What and how does light interaction with tissue or interaction with particles change in an absorbing media? So I, I spent a year digging into the theory and did some preliminary experiment and try to prove that there's a scattering change when the medium changing from absorbing to non-absorbing. And uh, after a year's study, uh, study we built up enough uh, theoretical background and then my advisor and I stood together and we were looking at our my preliminary results and then we realized it seems like when the the, uh, the, the medium changing from absorbing to non-absorbing the refractive index also get changed that leads to our thoughts that maybe this can be used to design this um, reduce the scattering methods for biological tissue I was on a call with one of your colleagues, and they were talking about how you even went back to studies from the 70s <laughs> when you were digging into the literature and like old things that nobody had even thought of to look at in a long time. Exactly. We were, um, because actually, the, we, what we were talking about is light interaction with particles. It's actually a very old topic that, if you remind us, this, is, this reminds me of the me scattering, really scattering, where people were theoretically investigate how the particles inter. Uh, interact with electromagnetic waves. All the theories are actually starting from there, but now we are putting into a new environment, new texture, that we are studying how this would affect in a biological environment and biological related questions. So thinking about the light scattering, what are some of the challenges kind of looking at that or, or figuring out how it even is interacting with different tissues or different surfaces? If we think about the scattering, so uh, why tissue is, this is important in biological tissue. So the physics behind this is actually quite sim- simple. 
So uh, a simple example is bubbled water. So if you can imagine that you have air, which is transparent, and the other is water, which is also transparent, when you mix this two together, you will see the um, the the bubbled water becomes whitish. How could that happen? And so when light goes through this, it goes through this microscale interfaces of air and water, water and air. So every time it goes through interfaces, the light changes its propagation direction. That's why the whole system become opaque or whitish color. So this is air water. The statistics behind this is the same as tissue. So tissue, as you can imagine, we are mostly made of water. We are composed of probably 60%, 70% water. And inside this aqueous background, there are functional biomolecules like proteins, lipids, fibrils. They have a relatively higher refractive index in comparison to water. So similar to this interface uh, description before, when life goes through, every time it changes this optical contrast, it will lead to a um, change of propagation direction and uh, the tissue becomes scattering. I think that's uh, the origin of scattering. And this limits all these optical imaging techniques because you can imagine light cannot penetrate very deeply into the tissue because of this existing scattering happens at the micro scale. Like, it's interesting because I had never really considered that you might be able to see through the skin in the way that you found here. Um, so to get to yeah. the to payoff, you've discovered a way to make skin translucent, more or less, and be able to see the different uh, yes, depths yeah. there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found you could use to do that? Right, right. In in, in our, uh, because we are in academia, so most of our research we are looking at how can this be improved for biomedical research. And optical imaging is one of the most important tool for biological research. So now we have a way that we can make us to probe the features that are usually embedded inside deep tissue. For example, what we have we have been proven as uh, several different examples. First one is we apply on the head and then we uh, visualize the vascular structures in the brain. So previously people can do this, but then you need to open the scalp or and skull, as, and you can imagine how invasive those are. But now we can directly apply this foot dye and make tissue transparent and visualize the vessels directly. And the other example we were doing as we are looking at sarcomere features, which are micron scale features in the limb. And previously what people do is they poke, they poke a fiber into your muscle and inspect it, but now us simply applying the food dye on the surface of the skin, we render the superficial skin transparent that directly visualize the muscles. And the other example we did is probably the most striking one as we apply on the belly of the mice, which is mostly the soft tissue, skin and uh, muscle. And by rendering all this overlaying tissue transparent, we can directly visualize the internal organs, small intestine, large intestine, liver, um, and then we can visualize how food is propagating and the, uh, the peristalsis process in the GI tract that, that pushes food forward. Very cool. Like, like digging through the paper, it's, it's super interesting to look at all of this and seeing some of the videos you guys were able to make out of it. Um, how did you find the dye or, or how did you think to try different kinds of dyes? Yep. Um, this goes a little bit back to what we have been doing before. So in my, when I started this, I started to investigate how absorbing molecules changes scattering. And uh, um, that time I, I actually already studied, a, I have a library of molecules that has different absorption properties. And I started to test them. Is that going to be better or not? And uh, I, I first find one molecule that is kind of showing some promising result, but it's not the, the one that the food dye we are using right now. But then one day I started to think, maybe food dye is going to be better because these dyes are people would, uh, I guess it's, they have this in food industry, they, have, they don't want to add a lot of molecules into the food. They want the most uh, strong absorbing molecules in the food. So you only need add a little, it has very distinct color. And then I, I, I kind of reached to different Foot, uh, the foot dye companies and even the largest ones and they ship me some samples I started to test are they going to work and surprisingly one of them becomes our optimized um, sample that is the uh, Tartrazine. <laughs> I think that's the story behind this is actually 
very interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, like how many, can you give me a ballpark estimate? How many kinds of diet did you test? In the paper we write about today, um, those are those are kind of uh, some useful diets. Uh, has has different applications, but in the I think uh, if we include all the other non not published ones, probably forty to fifty diets that total we used. Very cool. We tested. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about that testing? Like, how did you find success going through the diets? I think one unique part in our project is we are uh, why we we look for this is we have a very solid theoretical instruction. So uh, by merit, we first measure the absorption spectrum, and then we can estimate based on our theoretical modeling is this diet going to be promising or not. I think then after that we can uh, prepare the solution to a level that is comparable to our. Uh, real applications and quantify their real part and uh, imaginary part of refractive index using ellipsometer from from the share facility. I think that's something you mentioned that is actually supported by NSF. Yep, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> um, can you talk about that ellipsometer at the Stanford National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure Site? Yep, we were so lucky to have this. Uh, share facility, wonderful share facilities. It has a group of uh, different instruments that matches with our need. Because especially for us, because we are doing some some kind of projects that are relatively innovative. So we are not the most conventional users for this instrument. However, it's it's only because at this share facility they are very open to different applications. And then we ask them and they allow us allow me to do some of the piloting experiment to test how can we measure this to get accurate data and do different kind of data processing to extract values that are useful to us? And um, I become probably one of the most frequent user of that ellipsometer. And then I also trained uh, my group members. And then we, I think, um, this this instrument actually produced the most uh, important foundational data in our manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Professor Hong was talking about how uh, you guys were using it in a way that wasn't how they were typically using mm -hmm. it over exactly, there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, we are actually working with a solution sample, and usually this method is for thin film characterizations, that's for semiconductor. <laughs> that's why actually I should have mentioned this Kramer's chronic relationship is very well accepted in semiconductor industry, while for visible visible wavelengths and absorbing molecules, these are relatively new concepts. That's why no one have ever thought about what have, we have been doing before, that is doing so far. Very cool. So thinking about the takeaways and heading towards practical applications, and I, I think there's a, a patent to the process that's in, in process somewhere. Um, what would need to happen to make this viable for human use in the future? Yeah, so far we haven't done any really um, human applications, but physically, from the physics perspective, uh, tissues are just tissues. Uh, we don't see fundamentally reason why this cannot be used on uh, human tissues. However, human tissue um, has many difference from mouse tissue. Uh, one of the most obvious one is the thickness. Uh, the thickness of human skin is at least 10 times, depends on different locations, uh, at least 10 times thicker than mouse. So. If this is 10 times thicker, then usually if with our current method, it requires a hundred times longer time, which is means this is probably not a practical for human application immediately. However, um, there are ways, uh, there are more advanced drug delivery ways that people are developing. Um, I think that's one strategy. And then we also want to find better molecules that are more efficient um, and more safe uh, I think safer for human applications because that's actually one of the critical aspects for any human related um, applications. Right. And then you have the whole trials and all of that complication mm. added to it. Yeah. We envision probably that would take years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. How, how deep is it effective? Like how far into tissue? So um, it's an interesting question that um, we always think about. So for, for, but for our applications, usually um, the challenge is which part of the tissue is most scattering? So that's the skin. So for example, for the mouse application, um, we we clear the superficial skin and muscle, and then we can look directly into the deeper um, 
organs that are sitting inside inside the abdominal cavity. These are uh, because inside the cavity, these fluids are not scaring that much. So actually, we can see quite deep. Um, um, because this is one reason is because this in inside live animals, there are layered structures that are heterogeneous. Right. So uh, de defining the thickness really depends on where you are looking at. Um, however, we also did some. Um, a homo kind of homogeneous sample, for example, if we use a chicken breast tissue and try to see how deep we can still resolve features below it. Um, I think our estimation is about two millimeter. That's the thickness we can do so far. We should note that the, I think in most cases, this was not direct di food dye, like it's mixed with water or it's mixed with, um, you had like a hydrogel kind of solution. Can you talk a little bit about its effectiveness with different uh, portions, I guess. Yeah. So our recipe as well, uh, the effective part is the food dye. So that's the um, all the fundamental reason uh, that how it changes the optical property of tissue. So the reason we add a little bit of the hydrogel agros agros gel is we want to increase the viscosity of the solution a little. So it's it's not a solution that is flow around. Instead, it becomes like a cream that can stay in the location, and then we allow this dye to passively diffuse into the tissue. Um, I think that's all uh, we uh, in our current manuscript. That's all the components we used in our uh, product. <laughs> As you can see, this is a uh, innovative and uh, super interdisciplinary team. So when I was at Stanford, I was very lucky enough to get um, selected as an interdisciplinary postdoc scholar, which gave me an opportunity to talk with my major advisor, Gu Song Hong, which is in the material science engineering department, and my super, uh, a cool super, a cool advisor, Julia Koshmitz, and she's in the neurosurgery. She's an expert on the GI tract. I think this, this unique environment gave me the opportunity to learn from both engineer as well as biologists. And then I started to develop my own viewpoint. What are the important questions that I should resolve with my background in physics and engineering to, to applications in biology? I think it's Stanford actually, um, offers this unique interdisciplinary environment. And for example, I also bring on board uh, Professor Bronk, uh, Mark von Grossma, who is an expert on photonics, and he guided a lot of the optics experiment that we did. And his student, E. Chu, conducted uh, numerical simulations to validate all my experimental results. I think it's a group, such a group of talented and high quality researchers together, we made all these discoveries possible. Very cool. So the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about today is your professorship at UT Dallas and what you're working on now and kind of what do you plan to do in the future? Yep. Um, I was very lucky to join uh, UT Dallas, which is a, a rising school that is developing so fast. I'm sitting in my office, which is a new building. I have my own lab, um, pretty new, but empty. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are actively recruiting people together. So um, um, I can tell you a little bit more about my position is actually uh, I'm in the Department of Physics, but I'm recruited directly by the School of uh, Natural Science and Mathematics by a program called Biomedical Science. So why is uh, Biomedical Science? It actually aims to get a group of people who has degrees in chemistry, physics, and mathematics together, and we can answer questions that are important in biological science. I think that's why I feel so lucky that my background, my training in physics, material science, get evaluated in this biomedical science program. And I wish that I can continually producing this interdisciplinary work and innovative solutions to the biological questions. I think definitely in my own group, I'm going to continuously developing on um, these platforms, but I'm also hoping to um, utilize my knowledge in physics and material science to uh, think about more challenging questions that are in currently limiting biology. Right. It, it really speaks to bringing together the diverse viewpoints to make those grand challenges and transformations that you're aiming for. Exactly. So that's why I feel I'm so lucky I got this opportunity to spark my own career. Special thanks to Zahao O. Oh. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.